Greetings. Today we're going to look at these KVM switches. This one is a serve view by Dakota Computer Solutions, who later became Daxton. And this one is a descendant of it, which is the UltraView Pro and is by Rose Electronics. Now before we dive in, what's a KVM switch? KVM stands for Keyboard Video Mouse. And the KVM switch allows you to connect several computers to a single keyboard, video monitor and mouse. This could be in a server room environment, which this survey was originally bought for. The UltraView was bought as an addition because we also needed to connect the servers by Sun Microsystems, and that added the functionality. Later on, we bought a rack of Dell servers which came with a KVM unit similar to this one, which uses Cat5 cabling instead of big thick KVM cables, and these modules called server interface pods which go on the end. Out of the box, this KVM supports 16 servers, but each input can be connected to an 8 port expansion module. As a result, we bought a load of expansion modules and interface pods from eBay, both from Dell and from Avacent, where I assume make the units for Dell all license their technology, and that meant we could get the entire server room down to a single rack mount display unit and use the older KVM units elsewhere. And use them elsewhere is exactly what we did. One three shelf desk about eight feet wide, and we could get 16 PCs set up for wiping, testing and reinstalling simultaneously, all accessed from one common location. All that was needed for each PC was a power lead, KVM lead with a USB adapter and a network lead, all bundled together and numbered. Another smaller desk nearby had its own KVM setup and that could cope with another 10. The only reason we couldn't do more is that we literally ran out of KVM cables. Fast forward to now, the workshop's literally been bulldozed. We use laptops now and don't have a use for these KVM units anymore. So before they head to the recycling container, let's check them out and have a look inside while we're at it. On the front, we have a pair of buttons for selecting which unit to view together with two LEDs for each input, one of which shows power status and the other shows whether or not it's selected. Around the back, the two units look fairly similar to each other, apart from the power input, and the fact that the UltraView only has eight inputs. That's because this is an expandable unit. You can actually buy additional expansion cards to add more capacity. But that's not the only way they can be expanded. One of these units can be a master with every one of its inputs connected to another unit. Connect ServeView or UltraView units to every input on this UltraView Pro, and you can connect 128 devices to it. Max this out with expansion cards first, and you can connect 256. That's what we did here on a much smaller basis, with the ServeView adding 16 ports to the UltraView Pro, all of which gain the benefit of the UltraView Pro's on-screen display, which the ServeView doesn't have. The UltraView can also power at least some slave units, although this isn't mentioned in its manual, so I don't know how many it can drive, and which models it can drive presumably not 16, and maybe just the ones with the external power supplies. Inputs are via a variety of cables, and I've got some here. Showing just how old the serve view is, I've got a Dakota 5-pin DIN and serial mouse cable. I've also got a Rose one with a Sun 8-pin mini DIN connector. And I've got some PS2 ones as well. No USB ones though. By the time we started getting servers with USB ports, we were already using the Dell one instead. Other cables I have here are the Dakota keyboard video and mouse cable, which is all PS2, and this is where the actual keyboard monitor and mouse were connected. And a daisy chaining cable for connecting one to the other. Here it is set up as best I can, as I only borrowed one USB to PS2 adapter and it doesn't work, and I don't have a PS2 mouse. Still, it's got a PC, a Dell laptop and a MacBook Pro all hooked up. Inputs can be switched either by using the up and down buttons on the master unit or by pressing the control key followed by the number of the system to access. The one thing you may notice, although I may end up filtering it out, is that there's a high-pitched whine coming from the power supply of the UltraView Pro and that only happens with the servo connected. So it clearly is not very happy running the servo. And that may be because it's getting on a bit. Uh, it didn't used to do that, but it has been stuck in a box for a couple of years. And it did take at least a minute of pulsing and flickering and slowly taking longer and longer to stop flickering before it actually settled down and booted up. So I think the capacitors are probably gone on the power supply. There's not much else to see really. Control followed by F12 will bring up a menu where you can configure the system or you can configure the computer, the computer names and the keyboard types. 
I'm not going to go into these as these are in the manual anyway. What isn't in the manual is what's inside the units. So let's dig into the hardware. Looking inside, we can see we've got a stack of four boards. And that top board, interestingly, is missing components that would be there if this board were actually the main board. It's got provision for the switches. It's got provision for the power on and off switch. So it looks like the slave boards are just basically cut down versions of the main one. I've undone the nuts, so I can just take these connectors off. And it should unplug from the board below. Just like that. So we can see there's an address port pin there. As that is differently connected on the lower boards. In fact, the the first accessory board hasn't got any pins connected, then we've got the right hand one, then we've got this one in here. This is just daisy chained down, and as I said there's a there's a pin header there as well, which also connects down through the board at that point. That's us all the way down to the bottom board, and I think that last board was added at a later date, as they do have different revisions. This one says SV 2.75, this one's SV 2.76. As you can see the board is almost identical to the bottom board. This is a different part number, we'll see on the close-ups in a moment. And as I said earlier, it's got the switches and the power on light and of course the input jacks at the rear and the console port. Lots of hands there. It also connects to this ROM board here. Here's the master board which sits at the bottom. Let's see what's on it. I expect the key to this board, apart from the microcontroller of course, is the trio of EL4442CN multiplexers, one each for red, green and blue. Sync signals will be digital so they can be handled much more simply with gates or perhaps these groups of MOSFETs that are lurking on the board. U5 is the newest chip on the board with a date code for the second week in 1996. Something else to note bottom right is that the board isn't branded Dakota, it's branded Rose. So it looks like Rose were making them all along. Let's compare with the slave board from the top. The quad line receiver, voltage supervisor and EEPROM have gone, and the microcontroller now has onboard EEPROM, although good luck trying to erase that one as it's not a windowed package. Other than that, the chips are the same. Here's that additional board that sat alongside. What's on that? Nothing special, but it does contain the EEPROM that runs the whole show and some RAM to go with it. Again, we are looking at a board which is clearly a pared down version of the one below it. This time the extra connections are all on board, they're not part of the same, um, they're not plugged in. There's no riser at the edge where these ones had one. There is a jumper there for adjusting which uh, which um, which unit it is in the stack. Even the five pin DIN connector is there, even though that's not used in these, as they all use an internal switch mode power supply. Here's the master board which sits at the bottom. Let's see what's on that. Whereas the earlier unit used EL4442CN multiplexers for red, green and blue, this board has got a set of AD8174 analog multiplexers instead. It's also got some differential analog multiplexers socketed at the end. Possibly for audio. This is the multi-platform version, and apparently that version does gain audio capability. The newest chips on here appear to be the UART chips for the ninth week of 2004. Still old, but nowhere near as old as the serve view. Here's the slave. Let's see what's different. A 74LS20 dual 4 input NAND gate has turned up, but a GAL has disappeared, as has a voltage converter, a voltage supervisor, and a quad line receiver. The SRAM and flash memory have both dropped to a quarter of the size. Apart from that, obviously the front panel buttons and the KVM output connector, it's pretty much the same. Last of all, there's that on screen display board. 
Presumably the Genlock chip is used to synchronise the on-screen display with the video signal and the multiplexer is then used to switch this on-screen display in. There are transparent sections on the on-screen display but I suspect that might be done by switching just one or two colours over to the on-screen display and leaving the remaining two or one display in the original video to give a transparent effect. Something I found interesting when I dumped the flash was that it doesn't just contain the program code. A whole chunk of the same chip is used to store the names and configurations of all the inputs, as here we can see the names are set up for testing today. The slave boards don't contain this, they just contain a slave bootloader to get each board up and running ready to talk to the master. One thing I couldn't find on the internet at first is a pinout for the KVM port, so I've tested the cables we had and come up with this. We don't have Apple cables, serial cables, USB cables or anything with audio jacks, so obviously I couldn't test those. I did try wiring a USB cable in various configurations on pins 7 to 13 and 17 to 20 with no success, so I assume the official ones have a USB to PS2 chip embedded in one of the plugs. Of course, after coming up with this pinout, I managed to track down one of the original Surview Plus manuals on the German website, and it lists the pinout anyway. But it's done now. So there you have it. One of Rose's earliest KVM units, alongside a newer model, which is in fact still part of their current lineup. Hope you liked it. Thanks for watching.